on this morning. On behalf of the Director General Human Resources, Ministry of the Public Service, and the Director, Learning and Development Directorate, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this webinar presentation entitled Suicide Awareness, Coping with Challenges. My name is Sheila Grisette, Senior Human Resource Officer acting at the Learning and Development Directorate. I am your moderator for this morning's presentation. Assisting me with this webinar presentation is my colleague, Fian Jordan, Human Resource Officer, Learning and Development Directorate. The topic at the heart of this presentation discussion this morning has the potential to profoundly impact families and communities. Each of us face everyday demands and challenges of life, which can put considerable strain on our mental health. During today's presentation, we want all who are on the platform to have the full benefit of all of the information presented on what has been dubbed as a global phenomenon by the World Health Organization. Colleagues, you can greatly assist us in successfully meeting our objective by adhering to a few ground rules and rules of engagement. Please mute your microphones and disable your cameras. Please also pause and or minimize distractions as much as possible so that we can have your full, dedicated and undivided attention during the presentation. We welcome your participation in our webinar as we aim to make the session as interactive as possible. You can do so by posting your questions, comments and observations in the chat at any time during the presentation. We will monitor the chat and relay your questions and comments to the presenter. Please note that the presentation will be followed by a question and answer segment. Again, we encourage you to use the chat feature to post your questions at that time. And just as a reminder, the chat feature is found at the bottom of your screen. This morning's webinar will be recorded. The recording will be uploaded to the Learning and Development Director's YouTube channel. This will give you an opportunity to review the presentation should you miss any part of the live version this morning. Thank you again, colleagues, and a very warm welcome to everyone. It is so good to have you join us this morning at the Learning and Development Directorate. I will now introduce our presenter for this morning's webinar, Mr. Lauren Brathwaite. Mr. Lauren Brathwaite is a registered occupational therapist who's passionate about mental health advocacy. Mr. Brathwaite holds a BSc in psychology from the University of the West Indies and an MSc in occupational therapy from Brunel University, London. He's presently pursuing a Doctor of Science in Rehabilitation and Health Leadership with Queen's University. In relation to his professional work experience, Mr. Brathwaite worked as a locum therapist at the psychiatric hospital, and currently he's the acting coordinator for the Rehabilitation Therapy Technology Program at the Barbados Community College. In a private capacity, he provides mental health occupational therapy services to individuals on a part-time basis. In addition, to consultancy services, to public and private sector entities through his practice, free of hope therapy service. Mr. Braffitt regularly facilitates public education sessions on mental health related topics and has been a panelist on the People's Business and the Pause for Parenting radio show sponsored by Paradox. Most recently, he worked with the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment on the creation of the National Youth Hotline. I now turn over to Mr. Brathwaite to begin today's presentation on suicide awareness, coping with challenges. Mr. Brathwaite, good morning. Welcome, Hi, good morning, everyone. over to you. Thank you, Sheila. You're welcome. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, 
as you can see, um, what we and as what you've heard already, so we're going to discuss um, coping with challenges and also suicide awareness. Um, and what I aim to cover this morning um, is what is meant by the term mental health, and we're going to start there because really coping with challenges. It is it is related to our mental health, okay? And I think it is important. What, what I find sometimes is that we don't have an awareness. I mean, talking about suicide awareness as well, but we don't have an awareness of what our mental health is and what, what it entails and what it relates to, all right? So I thought that the best place for us to start is to just go through um, what, what mental health is. We look at um, how to monitor our mental health. We also discuss some habits to promote good mental health and then Moving on from that, then we will move into suicide. So terminology related to suicide, myths and facts, just a couple. I mean, there's a lot, but myths and facts related to suicide. Also tips for interacting with someone who may be suicidal. Okay, and then we, I also will share some places that we can reach out for help if we ever um, unfortunately are encountered with that situation, you know, where someone um, expresses that they're they want to take their own life okay so my first question um, for everyone is and as you heard you can put your responses in the chat and sheila and her assistants will relate them to me so what do you think about what's the first thing that pops into your mind when you hear the words mental health and what what is the first thing as a so what do you think about Okay, I see Mosea said wellness, balance. Claudette said the strength of mind, your mental state. Okay, that's good. That's good. Anyone else? Anyone else? What, what, what does it make you think about? Disorders. Okay. Uh -huh. Usually the first thing that I hear is somebody says it makes me think about black rock or the mental. <laughs> right, so this, so this is going nicely. So this suggests that you, that you have an awareness already, mental stability, Taking care of your mind and body, someone who is unable to cope with challenges, yeah, coping with life. Okay, okay. I, I, I like I like the way that we are thinking. Anyone else has anything to say to add? Bipolar, okay, which is a disorder. Cedric says the state of psychological, emotional well being, your mental ability to cope with life. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like these. I like these. All right, thank you. Should you can continue to monitor if, if people keep putting in and, and they say anything interesting for me, please. All right. So where we're going to start is just a definition of of, of mental health. Okay. And I know that this might um I don't know if you're looking at, at this from a computer screen or from your phone or whatever or your tablet, but I know that this might look complicated, but we're going to break it down, okay? But it says that mental health is a dynamic state of internal equilibrium, which enables individuals to use their abilities in harmony with universal values of society. Basic cognitive and social skills, the ability to recognize, express, and modulate one's own emotions, as well as empathize with others, flexibility and ability to cope with adverse life events and function in social roles, a harmonious relationship between mind and body represent important components of mental health which contribute to varying degrees to the state of internal equilibrium all right and just reading that um just straight off the first thing that we get from that is that mental health is complex all right it is not um it is not as simple as we sometimes boil it down to be right um Something that we will discuss in just a few minutes from now is that often people think that mental health is only when somebody is mentally ill or you only have a mental health problem when you are mentally ill and you need to be hospitalized. But that really is not the case. Okay, there, there's a lot more that goes into it and there's a lot of things that contribute to our mental health. The next thing is that if you want to simplify it, right, as I said, that, that, um, that definition was kind of long and complicated, but to simplify it, just to remember for ourselves is that our mental health is the balance of our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. So it is the balance of our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. 
So as I go on to break down um, what that definition was saying about mental health, so you have a deeper understanding of it, remember that it all relates to these three things. How you look at it, they all relate back to our em either our emotional, psychological, or social well-being. Okay? So here, these are these are the component indicators of mental health that were listed or described in that long definition that I just read or that I showed you. Okay, so the first thing it says here is that the, the basic cognitive and social skills. And when we're talking about cognitive skills, we're talking about things like attention, memory, organization, decision making. All right, those are all things that we have to use every day and not just in our higher order activities, um, to complete our jobs, but I mean, just it's just a simple thing to, to wake up and to decide what am I going to have for breakfast? You need to be able to pay attention enough so if you're going to boil an egg, you know, you, you boil something or you're cooking something so that you don't burn down the house, right? Memory organization, how, how can I, how will I plan out, how will I plan out my activities? And that is on a large scale, but also on a small scale, all right? And then the decision making, how do I make decisions? So that, that when we're talking about the cognitive skills, that's what we're relating to, how we, how we take in, how we process information. Then you have social skills, and social skills refers to verbal and non-verbal communication. So the basic things, um, I think that since probably most of us here are Barbadians, right, we can, we can always think about how, how, um, how, how we, we communicate without words. You know, our, our body language, how, how we act, how we carry ourselves in conversations. Just, just recognizing that um, it's, not, it's not always what you say. We will say it is it's how you say it, but it's sometimes it's not even how you say it. It's how you look saying it too, right? So that, that aspect, the nonverbal thing, and then you also have the verbal aspect, which is how you say it as well, your word choice. Sometimes your choice of words can communicate a lot more things than, than we consider, okay? The next one is emotional regulation, all right? And the emotional regulation is just the ability to recognize, express, and adjust our emotions. Um, if you think about it, how, how, is it, how is it going to be if every time I, I encounter someone who's experiencing an emotion, I come and let's say someone, someone at work is sad, and if we didn't have the ability to, to regulate our own emotions, um, just because somebody at work is sad, then the whole office is sad. All right, and they might not be sad about anything that is that is uh, relevant to us. They might be sad about something because they're not going to go to the concert they want to go to, or the effect that they want to go to. But if if regulating or controlling our emotions is an issue, then we we will sometimes pick up on other people's emotions. You can imagine how life would be. We wouldn't really get much done. The ability to recognize and then also express our own emotions and, and to be able to do it um, to be able to do it appropriately. So if it's not only because you, you can think about how negative emotions can put us in trouble. Like if we get angry and we decide, you know what, I'm so angry, I'm going to slap this person in their face and we don't have the self-control, we can't regulate our emotions and that happens. Or sometimes it could be that we're so happy that that you know we might do something that um, is out of place especially because this is a this is a work seminar so thinking about that sometimes you can get so happy that you might do something which might be a little inappropriate at work you might say something um or act in a way that might not be might not be appropriate simply because you got a little overwhelmed with the happiness emotion so being able to regulate our emotions um and how that informs our actions is, is an is an important indicator of mental health empathy the ability to experience and understand what others feel without confusing it with our own emotions. So again, as I said before, with the regulation, meaning that um, I see that you you feel the way, and you might be feeling angry, you might be feeling happy, but if I can't separate that from my own emotions, then that that is an indicator that there might be a challenge. Right? That is an indicator that there might be a challenge. Um, we we see now. If you go online, sometimes you see things on social media talking about an empath, and that is all well and good, but there's a, there's a, some, there's a stopping point. 
yeah you know you can't always go on around go around allowing other people's feelings to overwhelm you and if that is happening um it's not that you're allowing it necessarily but if you do have if you do generally have a mental health issue then that might be something that you need to work on something that you might come to see a therapist about to help you manage your your emotions and how other people's emotions affect yours then you have the mental flexibility um this is which is one of the things that several people um, put in the put in the chat right coping um dealing with challenges etc so the ability to cope and adapt with challenges in the in the sense that um life 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 is not always a bed of roses yeah life is not always a bed of roses so sometimes um we, we don't know when when bad news or when a challenging situation is going to come for us right at this very moment the phone could ring and we could get bad news they could get bad news about a relative or something like that and that that can affect um my whole day right or in fact depending on the, the, the level of bad news that might affect the rest of my year or the rest of your year so the ability that we that we have to cope and adapt with challenges you have the large challenges but then you also have simple challenges as well so let's say just a simple thing does not go your way um you go you go to the store and you find that you know they've run out of the item that you want if it is that um you don't have good mental flexibility that can become a crisis that can become a crisis and that that is one of the indicators that we that we look at when we're considering um, the state of someone's mental health all right and then in um inversely right if, if someone does have the ability to cope well with challenges and, and to adapt and to look to resources to help them get through tough times and that is an indicator of good mental health after that we have the functioning in social roles so the ability to fit in socially and have meaningful social interactions so things like making friends and being an employee forming a part of a community yeah um so we live in a society and we all have parts to play not in the sense that you necessarily are putting on a mask and you're being a fake person but meaning that there's social expectations um the the, the behavior that we that we expect from an employee like if we go into a place of business like let's say let's say i had to go go into the bank right i i, I wouldn't expect um the the workers in the bank the males in the bank you know to be walking about in shorts in short shorts unless it's some sort of special day that they're having you know and that is that is thing but that that is not something that we expect so even even just when we go into certain situations we expect to see certain things we have um certain cultural norms an example that i always use is what when when someone enters a room and if the person does not um greet the room or acknowledge the room you know as barbadians because politeness is is uh is I would say that's an important value for us, right? That's something that's ingrained in us from, from childhood. So if someone enters the room and they don't speak, we automatically start to to form opinions about them, you know, that, that they are manly, all right? That, you know, that, that they're not speaking, they're not acknowledging the room. And that, that in turn often affects our, our interaction with them going forward. So the ability to function in expected roles, to understand what is expected of us and how, how we go about it, that is also, an indicator of mental health and then you have the mind body harmony so the way we think and feel about our bodies and our capabilities and i describe this in, in in the way that how do you think about yourself that little voice in your head do you think that you're ugly do you think that you're stupid do you say unkind things to yourself sometimes people would never know we can be very critical of ourselves and if we are to the point that you know we, we um are unhappy right we, if, if we're to the point that we're unhappy in our body um unhappy with our abilities not not settled that and that is a, a chronic thing that that is an indicator of, of mental health as well how how comfortable we are in our own skin how comfortable we are about our own abilities um, we might know i'm not the smartest person in the world i'm not a genius but i still have some intelligence um i might not be good at maths i may not be good at english but i might be great at working with my hands yeah so that that sort of idea or i mean i might not be great at working with my hands but i'm i'm great at math not so good at english so being honest with ourselves and having a realistic view of our of our mind of our and our and our body and how we, how we view ourselves and our abilities 
okay so these these six things these are the things that 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 um that that definition of 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 mental health that I just read to you, that was what it was describing. So it breaks it down into these six areas. And these are all things that make up our mental health. Is is this is what I want you to understand. So our this is our what you're looking at is a picture of our mental function, how we interact with people, how we go about through the day, how we go through life. Right? So and these are the indicators that we look at when we're considering the state of someone's mental health. So in addition to, 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 the, to, the, to those six indicators, the next point I want to make is that mental health is dynamic and it is, it is variable. So it is not, as I said um, before, it is not just a case of you being either mentally ill or not mentally ill, right? Um, our mental health actually goes back and forth, um, goes back and forth as we go through, not even just go, go through life, but as we go through, hour by hour on a daily basis, right? Hour by hour on a daily basis, our mental health can be going back and forth. As I said, let's say you're going fine right now, but then something happens. You get a call. And then based on that call, then you're, you, it is something, a challenge that you did not expect, right? Sudden news, right? Sudden good news or sudden bad news, right? Who knows? But it's a challenge you, you did not expect, and you have to cope with it. And then if you have difficulty coping with that, for that moment while you're coping with that, if you're not coping well, then your mental health is not so great. All right? Um, now, mental health, like physical health, is made up of our mental well-being and our mental illness diagnosis. Right? And I use this example. If, let's say, you... You saw me. Let's say we were doing this face to face, and when when I when I came to the room that we're in, you know, there's just about five or six steps for me to get up to the door. You can see through the door because the door is a glass door. Now you see me come up those six steps, and when I get to the top of those six steps, you see me stop and I huffing and puffing. All right. Now, if you speak to my doctor, my doctor will say that I don't have any illnesses, I don't have any um, diagnosis of any sort, no chronic diseases, nothing like that. But yes, but but um, based based on that, if you see someone just huffing and puffing after six steps, we do tend to think that um, that that person is not in the best physical health, and that's because we, we we think of fitness as well as a component of our of our physical health. So it's not just about whether we have dysfunction in our body, but also how. Um, how capable our body is. So our level of fitness, the wellness of our body, if we go go to the point just that, not just the absence of, of, of um, as we had here before, it's not just the absence of illness, right? Not just the absence of, of disease, but then we start to look at the, the, the best function or the, or the, the, the uh, maximum functional capacity of the body. We see that as an indicator of our physical health as well. So it's the same thing for our, for our mental, mental health as well too. Now, I just have a diagram here, which I want you to take a look at. Um, I'm hoping that you can see my mouse moving around on the screen. But this is called the Complete State Model of Mental Health. And it, it's just intended to give us a picture of what mental health looks like. So you can have um, on the up and down, you have your level of mental well-being. All right. Um, how, how well you are performing. Because, and then you have on the left to right, right, um, you have the mental illness diagnosis all right now again it is possible that i don't have any illnesses in my body but still because i'm unfit i might not be in great physical health so it is also possible that i may have a chronic disease i may be diagnosed with hypertension i may be diagnosed with diabetes um, i may have asthma right whatever that is but because of that that doesn't mean that I can't live a full and healthy physical life. I can still take part in activities, and I, I might be fitter than than the the other person who has no um, illnesses, right? So it's the same thing with mental health, right? So if you look at this, if this were physical well-being, you have physical well-being, and then you have um, the left to right will be physical illnesses, all right? So just because you have a, a what what I'm getting at is that just because and you can see here this example, so Janet, just because you have a a mental health um, just because you have an illness that doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot have um, good mental well-being so this first one in the top left hand quadrant here we have good mental well-being and no diagnosis of mental illness 
So Janet, she doesn't have a diagnosis. She enjoys being sociable and is very productive at work. All right, so then we move over now to the right hand, top right hand quadrant, which is high mental well-being or, and then, but still you can have um, a clinical disorder. All right, so you can have good mental well-being despite being diagnosed with a mental illness. So let's say that Tom is somewhere here. All right, um, he's diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Right? He will fall somewhere within this quadrant. So he's diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but he manages his illness well and it doesn't affect his full-time work, right? So he doesn't have a high level of symptoms that he, that he needs to be off work. So he's, he'll be here. He's working, he's doing well. He doing what he's supposed to do. Um, he's going to see a psychiatrist or his doctor and he takes his medications if he's being ordered medications and he does other things to, to make sure and he monitors himself for his symptoms of mental illness. Coming down now to the bottom left, um, we have Kofi. So poor mental well-being, but no diagnosis of mental illness. So example I use for this is let's say um Kofi is Kofi is a Kofi is a, is a is a is a young is a young parent. Now Kofi, his his son, his son um is just entering um school, secondary school. Now Kofi remembers when he was at secondary school that he was bullied because he did not have um you know the best shoes and the best clothes he used to get hand-me-downs from his from his brothers because he, he grew up poor now for Kofi this is an important thing Kofi always promised himself that when um, when I have children I will make sure that they don't have to go through what I went through so Kofi is at work Kofi doesn't have a high paying job but time to school is coming so and Kofi is worried now because Kofi is really thinking about how am I going to get this money to get these things for my son where am I going to get this from? And, and this is something that is really worrying Kofi because it is important to Kofi. So even though Kofi doesn't have a diagnosis, um, a psychiatric diagnosis of any illness, anxiety um, would be, is worrying him, right? It's not a disorder, but anxiety is worrying him because, you know, he's, he's thinking about the situation at home. How can I get these things? How can I get these things? And it's, it's on his mind to the point that distracting him from work. Right? And, and he, he's not working, he might be a little um, snappy with other people at work because he's really thinking about this and he doesn't know where he's going to get the money from. All right, but he doesn't have a disorder. He doesn't need to be hospitalized. And then the bottom right hand now, you have Sally who has poor mental well-being, right? So Sally will fall within this quadrant here, somewhere around here, poor mental well-being and has a diagnosed mental illness. So Sally's diagnosed with depression. Um, she does have a job, but unfortunately, because she's having a depressive episode, she's off on sick leave. So her symptoms here, she would be, her symptoms would be high, and she would be down here to the uh, both extremes. So her symptoms would be high, and her mental well-being would be high at that point in time. As opposed to Kofi, Kofi would probably be around here, right? He does have um, symptoms, he does have a diagnosed illness, but he doesn't have symptoms that stop him from, from working. All right, so this, this is just to depict and uh, for us to consider that just because someone has a, a psychiatric illness in fact sometimes people that you work with and you have no idea they may have a mental a mental health issue right but because it's none of your business you don't know okay so just because someone has a mental health issue doesn't mean that they cannot function and that they need to be hospitalized all right so we really need to expand our our conceptualization of, of mental health all right now our mental health status is continually shifting as we go through life as i said and what i want us to look at now is how we can monitor our mental health so we're going to look at something um, called the mental health continuum all right and the mental health continuum um, and you can look this up online for yourself um, there's tons of different versions of it um, I, the, the, this presentation is being recorded so you can review this one if you want but if you want to go exploring on your own you can look up the mental health continuum or there's several different versions of it but it looks at our functioning in four areas to give us a clear picture of our mental health status okay so it is looking at what we do how we feel how we think and how we feel in our bodies okay and it breaks these down into six years so mood attitude sleep physical health activity interaction and habits and if you um think about this if you have to go back and look at the six things that we looked at you see again how that this 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 fits in with um the six component indicators of mental health okay now this i know you can't see this it's probably really small on your screen but don't worry we're going to break down and look at each um category okay 
but I just put this big picture in so you can see how it goes. It is a continuum, meaning that the idea that we go back and forth as we go through our life, it is a dynamic thing. And when we say dynamic as well, I didn't mention this before, but when we say, or when I say dynamic, right? When we use the term dynamic in mental health, what we're saying is that I, 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 I am affected by situations in my life, but I also affect situations. So let's say again um, that the example that I gave, you know, I, I come into a room. Let's say I was presenting to you in person again, right? I come into a room and I don't, I don't greet you all when I come into the room. I just come in and I sit down. I don't say a word to anybody. I just sit down, right? And then when it is time for me to speak to you, if I want to be all cheery and pleasant, I'm sure that, that the way you respond to me would likely be, be different as to if I came in the room and I, and I um, greeted persons, I interacted with persons a bit, right? So because of how I came and how I presented myself, that impacted on the, if you want to say, the, the energy or the vibe, that's the word that we, people tend to use nowadays, the energy or the vibe in the room, all right? So it's the same thing with, with, with situations in our life. Things happen, how we respond to those situations can affect the situation, then which in turn can have an effect on us. So it is a continual um, interaction back and forth, right? Continual back and forth about how, how we interact with these things. So. The first um, stage on the continuum, right, is, and just just for reference to, as I always say, the reason for this continuum is not for you to go around and um, tell people that they need to be hospitalized, all right, or they need to be they need to be in a psychiatric hospital. This is just is not a diagnostic tool. This is just for us to to be able to to check in with our mental health or check in with the mental health of persons that we love, okay. So the first um, column on the continuum, or the first stage, is called excelling. So this is when you have excellent mental health. This is good. This is good mental health. So you have um, normal mood fluctuations. You positive, optimistic. You have a good sense of humor, a healthy sleep routine. Um, you're physically active, and you don't have any concerns with your memory over here. What it looks like, you concentrate and you focus well on tasks. You have high performance and productivity. You're present and highly engaged. You can focus on things. Yeah, this is what we would say, you know, when you you spot on, you're sparking. All right. Now, if you um, look at these two, these both do you, you have achieving and then you have excelling, and they're very similar. the The only difference between the two is what um, you see here. You see that physically active and you consciously engage in physical health routines or programs. So you're deliberately taking steps to take care of your physical health. And then you also see again, socially active, you consciously seek healthy social connections. Okay. So again, that, that is the idea that there, you're taking deliberate steps. You're taking deliberate steps to, to work on your, your social, your social interactions, have good um, connections with people. All right. Um, you can see the other ones there as well. Good energy, physically well maintained, stable weight, limited or no alcohol consumption. And we'll get back to those things, the habits as well. All right. But what what I want you to take from these two is that the the idea of, of having excellent mental health is that you, you need to be intentional about it. All right. You have to take deliberate steps. You need to prioritize it in your life. So that is the that is the first step. The first, the first step, the first idea, the first tool for us in maintaining our mental health, preserving our mental health, and then by extension, ensuring that we are able to cope with challenges when they come. All right. So it is that we have to prioritize our mental health and take deliberate steps. All right. So you consciously engage in physical health routines and also seeking healthy social connections. Now, what you're supposed to do when you're in, in this good health area, you practice self-care and seek social support. I will explain what self-care um, self is on the next slide. Are there some things about self-care? And you focus on the task at hand. If you have a problem, you break it down into manageable chunks. You identify and take care of support systems. You work to maintain a healthy lifestyle in the sense um, that the identify and take care of support systems. Who are the people in your life that, that um, people or even organizations that are supportive of, of you? It shouldn't be that we only have, we only interact with people when we want something, when we need something. So if you want to, if you want support, you make sure that you're there to support others as well. Okay. And that comes back again with the whole thing back here on the first, on the, in the excelling category that you 
seek healthy social connections because if you seek healthy social connections you think about what i need to do in this interaction as well as what i would like this person to do too okay so now when we talk about self-care um i have some things here they call the five ways to wellness and this is from the the uk's national health service their version of the ministry of health all right and this is and it's not just them um you will find that as you look across the world at um mental health programs, um, psychiatric programs as well, but just mental health initiatives. There's research that suggests these, these five things that I'm going to list for you now, that they are uh, protective factors for our mental health. So the first one is to connect with other people, as we already said. So you work on building stronger and closer relationships with friends and family. All right, you take the time out, you know, go and visit a relative um, to, to communicate with them, to really interact with them and have conversations with them. All right, next thing again, as we already said, you be physically active. Now, doing this, um, it will raise your self-esteem once you go about it in the right way, and it also causes positive chemical changes in your brain. Anybody um, on the webinar right now who, who, who does, who works out and exercises, you know, they will talk, you, you hear people talk about endorphins, and that's that, that, that feel good feeling that you get when you're working out, because so that's actually causing chemical, um, chemicals to be released in your brain, which positively affect our mood. Next thing that you can do is that you can learn new skills. So this is, um, you, this is the, and it's not that you have to sign up for a course. You don't have to come, come to BCC and see me or another tutor in a classroom or um, do something like that. You, you, you don't have to be formal about it. You don't have to go to polytechnic or skills training, right? You can do it simply. YouTube is a thing, right? YouTube is a very, is a very useful tool that we have. Log on to YouTube and if you always decide that you want to learn knitting, Look, look for a knitting tutorial, look for a tutorial on doing woodwork, if you're into woodwork, look for new recipes, right, that sort of thing. Doing this, learning a new skill of some sort, right, can boost our self-confidence and it helps provide us with a sense of purpose. So you, essentially, that you have a new hobby that you're looking forward to, and this is what, this is what I'm going to do, yeah? What, whatever it is. Um, if you decide that you want to go into coding, if you want to go into, if you want to do, we, we also have Coursera as well, where you can do those online courses in a flexible way. You decide that you want to learn about, um, about, I forget the term, um, ph ah, photovoltaic cells, you know, solar energy. You decide you want to learn about that, go and do it, right? It boosts your self-confidence and it helps provide us with a sense of purpose, something to look forward to. And especially if, you know, we, we not, don't have positive things happening in other areas of our life, possibly, um, that can be a nice, a nice little boost that we get. The next one is give to others. Um, doing this can feel very rewarding. It also raises our feelings of self-worth. And giving to others, it doesn't have to be money. It can be of your time. Um, if, if you might be a part of an organization that already does this, or you might be part of an organization that does this, but you don't take part, you know. So Christmas is coming up. You have um, places that do like um, the Salvation Army with their hamper drive. You have other places that do that. Also, um, I, I also always put in a plug for, for the government institutions. So um, the, the children's homes, right? The psychiatric hospital, the geriatric hospital. There are people, I, I can tell you that there are people in there who, who sometimes essentially are forgotten and they don't have relatives to come and bring things for them. So if you, if you have clothes that are you know, in good condition and you want to give away, it doesn't always have to go to Salvation Army. You can you can take them to those institutions as well, all right. And and particularly the children the children's um, homes and stuff like that, right? You you can take things there and, and they will be used. If if it is that you go to the district hospital or the geriatric hospital, if you feel like you can buy a pack of adult pampers or something like that and take there and leave it, and I guarantee you that 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 will be get, that will be used. You might not even see it past three days or one day, depending on how things are there. Okay, so remember that we have places where some people are forgotten and, and they need support. So those are all options for us giving to others. And the next one is um, something called mindfulness. So paying attention to the present moment. All right, and I know some people hear mindfulness, and we had a big scandal about this, I think, a couple of years ago. But people hear mindfulness and they think about meditation and stuff like that. So it's not really, it's not the same thing. Um, Meditation is more about the emptying your mind, but mindfulness is just about paying attention to the present moment. Um, if it is that you're doing it in, from the physical perspective, it's about being aware of your sensations in your body, uh, paying attention to your breathing, etc. And then also, um, you can also do it from the emotional perspective. So I have a little exercise that I would like you to, to take part in with me, if you can indulge me, if you're at work and you're able to. All right, so 
it is a breathing exercise. So if you can, um, just follow, follow the prompt of my voice, all right? And this is called box breathing. Um, and what I want you to do, I will count and you just follow my instructions. So breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, last time, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. So just quickly in the chat, tell me how, how that felt. Anyone, if you were able to do it. Ah, Mosai says it was relaxing. <laughs> T Clark says it has relaxing in capital letters, so it was it was it was nice. <laughs> right? Yeah, relaxing. So so this relaxing, yes, relaxing also, right? It's so you down. And so I hope you mean so you down in a good way, you know, like um it just mellowed you out, Jennifer, Miss Sun or Mrs. Sun. Yeah, Kami. God that says it was Kami. Okay. Now, now this this is um this is a and you can see there if you're still looking at the screen you can see there that I have it is especially good for anxiety okay so if if you are having a rough day um if it's just like say just before you have to do a talk before a meeting or something you know that that has offset you has caused you to feel a bit anxious I know the anxiety you feel like your heart rate increasing etc so if if that um is the case then you can do this sort of breathing exercise i have another one belly breathing there that's just you breathe in and you have your hand on your belly and you breathe you push out your diaphragm when you're inhaling okay and um, when you are breathing when you're exhaling now you tighten your diaphragm right but these are exercises that you can do so engaging in this it causes your heart rate to drop all right it really causes your heart rate to drop it, it lowers the heart rate and um it really um does naturally give us a calming sensation, lowers anxiety in the immediate moment. All right, thank you so much for posting your responses in the chat. Now we are going to move on to mental health problems. All right, so moderate mental health. Now, mental health problems are not diagnosable disorders, and they cause changes in, in our behavior and thinking and emotions that might only be noticeable with people who are close to us, people who know us well. There's some distress and inability to cope, but we're still capable of performing like our daily life functions, all right? They can increase our vulnerability to mental illness, but they're not quite the same thing. So you have here, and when you get into this column, you have the column, this is reacting. So this is where you might be nervous, irritable, you have showing impatience, you might be um, quite sarcastic, you might be having intrusive thoughts and nightmares. An example of intrusive thoughts is what I was saying about Kofi, you know that this thing, I keep on thinking about this thing and I cannot put this thing out of my mind to focus on what it is that I want to do, right? So that's when we will consider a thought that's intrusive that we cannot control, um, or we're losing a bit of control about when a thought is popping into our heads. Trouble sleeping, distortion of physical activities decrease, low energy, muscle tension, some way again are weight loss, and they have regular to frequent alcohol consumption, binge drinking and other addictive behaviors. Now, the addictive behaviors here, just quickly, this is not um, only alcohol or, or other substances, drugs, etc. Um, addictive behaviors can include shopping, it can include pornography, it can include sex, it can include food, it can include um, binge watching TV series, okay? There, it can include gaming, right? Using the computer, social media, all of those are things that we can be, be engage in sometimes um, that we find that we use as a distraction, right? So we need to. The idea of this with that, that section here is that we need to pay attention to our behaviors and what we're doing and, and realize that that might be an indicator that we're not doing so well mentally, 
okay so if you find that some of your things it's not that you're going to be always in in one column um clearly all right it's, that's not always the case so you might find that you have a couple of things in the green and then you might have one that is in the yellow all right so it's not you're not going to be strictly in columns right so just let me be clear on that so if you find that you're in in the reacting column and this is when something happens but this is some this is just a challenge that we're dealing with but we can come back from it all right so what we do again is we practice self-care and seek social support all right so the same five ways to wellness and also um you know if we need to speak to a friend if you have a friend or someone that we have a good relationship with i need to talk about something you know spend some time with them that might be necessary so you recognize your limits you identify and minimize stresses in your life wherever possible sometimes the stress is work I can't necessarily um, minimize the stressor because it, it, you can't just quit your job, all right? But wherever possible, you identify and minimize the stressor in your life. You engage in healthy coping strategies, and this is directly related now to the to the addictive behaviors that I just mentioned, all right? So healthy coping strategies, not as in don't just practice escapism, as you would say. You may need to think about the problem and confront the problem and try to deal with it in some way. Make sure that are do your best to get adequate food, rest, and exercise. So after the yellow no, then we move over to the to the injured column. All right. And when we get to injured, you notice here that you see anxiety, you see anger, you see sadness and hopelessness and negative attitude, recurring thoughts and nightmares, restlessness and sleep disturbance, several other things that you see there. Now when you get to this injured one, this is when probably a significant problem has occurred and you do need to see a professional okay um and when i say a professional just let me say make sure that it is someone um i always say this and is i i'm a i'm a christian i go to church all right i go to church every week right but when you when i say seek professional help make sure that the professional that you're seeking help from is a professional because um the, the term counselor is not a regulated term in barbados so you have some people that do not have proper training and build themselves as counselors and because you do not have a law against that um, they can do as they like all right and sometimes you find it in the church when persons are having a mental health issue and the, the church is not equipped to deal with it and they really should be seeing a professional and they can end up causing more harm than good all right so you identify and understand your own warning signs you seek social support and talk to someone and you ask for help and that's a big thing for us men that you have to ask for help all right so no after the injured column we move in to poor mental health which is mental illness so mental health disorders are diagnosable um, for mental health problems to be a diagnosed disorder it usually has to be causing a problem or dysfunction in cognitive emotional or behavioral functioning and it usually causes severe distress right distress and is usually a response that is not typically or culturally expected and there's some sort of pattern so just the same way that when you go to the doctor and you if let's say you go to the doctor and you tell the doctor um i'm not feeling so good my tummy is hurting i vomited and the doctor will ask you questions and try to work out based on what you say the pattern that that the doctor gathers from you they will decide if you have food poisoning or if it is if, if it might be your appendix or whatever it is all right so in mental health you make a diagnosis based on the patterns that are observable so here now when you're in the red zone high anxiety depressed mood anger volatility non-compliant i hear no suicidal thoughts which we're going to discuss immediately after this right um cannot fall asleep isolation social withdrawn illness or pain extreme weight gain or weight loss severe alcohol consumption and trouble in your life because of the alcohol or substance use whatever it is okay so if you find yourself in this red column you definitely probably need professional help um and sometimes you might need to be hospitalized okay so Seek professional consultation as needed. You follow professionals, the psychiatrists, the psychologists' recommendations, and you work to regain physical and mental health. Now, just some final thoughts on mental health, okay? Mental wellness and illness. There's a difference between a mental health problem and a mental illness. And being diagnosed with a disorder does not mean that someone's life is over. Somebody that ends up in the red zone that we were just looking at, they can return to the green zone with the right support and they can live a normal, fulfilling life. And being diagnosed with a mental illness or a mental disorder does not mean that somebody is constantly mentally ill. Um, it doesn't mean that they can't have a job, that they can't go to school, etc. It doesn't mean that they need to be locked away. 
all right? It just means that they have, have an issue and they need to face it and they have to work on it. So you really shouldn't use it, the terms like OCD and bipolar, schizophrenic casually because it can be hurtful to persons that are actually living with a mental illness. All right, so just, just some thoughts on that before we move on now to suicide. So suicide itself is not a mental disorder, okay? But mental disorders are one of the major contributing factors to suicide. So something that we don't, um, I think generally people don't realize is that suicide is a symptom, okay? There's, there could be many reasons why someone is feeling suicidal. Like sometimes it can be not because of a low mood or depression or anything like that. Sometimes it can just be because of medication, okay? That you start to take, take a medication and some, for some medications, I know you hear that if you watch um, TV, right? And you see sometimes suicidal thoughts that can be a side effect, a possible side effect of medication. So there's plenty of things that can contribute to suicide. So it's not all just because somebody um, is having, is having um, a mental health issue, all right? So just some of the terminology. Suicide refers to death caused by self-directed, harmful behavior done with the intent to die as a result of the behavior, okay? Now, a suicide attempt is a non-fatal self-directed potentially harmful behavior done with the intent to die as a result of the behavior a suicide attempt sorry I should, a word is missing from there a suicide attempt may not result in injury now the reason why this is important is because there's something else which is not the topic of our discussion today but you have non-suicidal self-harm some, some particularly teenagers that's what we are seeing in now here in barbados that you have teenagers who may be cutting themselves and doing things to themselves we generally cutting themselves they call it cutting self-harming because of um, a particular stressor or something that they have in life, they use that as a quote. But that is not um, guaranteed to be a suicide attempt. So when, when they're spoken to, when the psychiatrist speaks to them or the mental health professional speaks to them, that, that intention to die is an important um, discriminating factor, okay? Suicide ideation refers to thinking about, considering, imagining, or planning suicide. So the thought content sometimes might be obvious, you may hear someone say, I have a plan and nobody can stop me. Right? Nobody can stop me. I've been thinking a lot about killing myself lately. All right? Or the subtle ones, sometimes you hear something people say, I want to sleep and I, I, I want to go to sleep and I never want to wake up. Or I, I wish I could just die. Or life does not seem worth living anymore. Okay? So those are subtle things that sometimes people slip into conversations as well. All right? So now you understand the terminology. All right? Some of the, the warning signs. Okay? People talking about wanting to die, um, they might express that they have great guilt or shame. They might feel that they're a burden to others. Um, they may be feeling, right, or expressing the feelings that they feel empty, they feel hopeless, they feel trapped, or have no reason to live. Um, they may be extremely sad, increasingly anxious, agitated, or this last one, full of rage, which sometimes people don't recognize as well. Okay, that sometimes when people are very angry, right, that could be a warning sign. Um, that they might be considering suicide, okay? Or, and they're expressing um, unbearable emotional or physical pain, all right? And that there, the unbearable emotional or physical pain, that is a key, um, is a key thing, all right? And that is, that is often, because sometimes we can't really rationalize how someone might want to end their own life. Right, but it is that they're experiencing this unbearable emotional pain, and they they think that this is the the best way for me to 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 get out of it. Right, so they made that decision. They're not thinking rationally, um, but they decide that that is what it is. You also have the physical pain now, and this this then sometimes goes into and we don't have um, physician assisted suicide in Barbados, right, or what we would call euthanasia. Um, but in some countries, I think I think it's the Netherlands that that is that is an issue that people who have a terminal disease, um, a disease that is very painful, very um, a degenerative disease, they may consider suicide because of that. So they might not uh, be feeling depressed or having the, the low mood, but because of the intolerable physical pain, they may um, consider suicide, and that can happen as well. Yeah. So you have a, a debate going on, like um, academics and, and I guess theorists an ethicist as well discussing whether or not that is appropriate if someone has a terminal disease that you know their prognosis is 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 not great or not great or is, is i mean if it's terminal is it okay for them to say well i would like to end my life now 
or is it appropriate for them to continue to suffer? Yeah, and that's a harsh thing for us to think about. Um, and we don't, that's not in our law books or anything like that, but that is a, a possible reason, uh, a possible warning sign as well, right? That they're experiencing this emotional or physical pain and then they decide that, um, or that suicide is the option for them. The behavioral changes, no, all right? You have making a plan or researching ways to die. So, and we live in a technological age, so sometimes they do this by looking online. Um, they might be buying pills or they might buy a weapon of some sort, right? Um, doing that sort of thing. Withdrawing from friends now, saying goodbye, um, giving away important items or making a will. So sometimes, um, usually let's say about two to three weeks before someone um, is, or maybe in, let's say in a month before someone is planning to act on their suicide, suicidal thoughts, you may find that they might call you and they might say, um, I might say, Susan or Jeffrey, uh, this is my, I want, you, I want you to take care of my, um, my radio. You know, they may have like a, ra a radio, I just use the example of a radio, I'll take care of my radio, or this is my ring. You know, my ring that I like so much that, call this and take care of it for me, right? Call this and take care of it for me, all right? Or they might say, you know, if, if they have children, yeah, I, want, I want you to look after, look after my son or my daughter, look after my nephew. They will say those sorts of things, all right? Because they're preparing for their departure. Okay, um, something that I do not have here, um, but that just occurred to me is also that about roughly, let's say about two weeks before someone commits suicide, you may notice that they have an, a sudden elevation in mood. Let's say you know this person, this person was struggling with depression for quite some time, right? They were sad and, you know, all the other things that we had here on the previous slide, okay? Talking about feeling, sorry, feeling, uh, go back, go back, okay? Talking about feeling hopeless, trapped, and no reason to live, and then two weeks before, you know some people will comment and say that, well, he, 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 he started to perk up though. He would seem a bit more positive and, and, and he, he looked like he was going good, so it take me by surprise. But what happens is when that person has made the decision and they've committed to the decision that they're going to commit suicide, in their mind, in their, um, their rationality, as I said, it is a flawed logic, um, flawed rationality that they operate under, in their mind, they have come to the solution for the stress, the problems that they're having. Okay, so I have an escape. So yeah, so I know I'm, I, I won't have to struggle with this anymore. When I, when I take this, I will go to sleep and I won't wake up. Right, so I, I won't have to worry about this anymore. So that gives them something to look forward to. Again, as, um, as difficult as it might be to think about that, that gives them something to look forward to. Right, so you see an elevation in their mood because of that. All right, you might see that they're taking dangerous risks that is driving in extremely fast. They might be displaying mood swings. They might be eating or sleeping more or less. They might be using drugs or alcohol more often. And you probably will notice um, if if you rewatch this and you go back or you download, you go and look up the mental health continuum. A lot of these things, these behavioral things, are things that you see in the red zone. All right, and they're there for a reason. Yeah. So, because, as I said, suicide is a symptom. It's not, it's not in and of itself, it is not a, a mental health illness or anything that is a symptom of, of a wider problem that is going on. All right? Now, just some quick myths and facts about suicide. So, we think that people who, who talk about suicide do not commit suicide. Um, and that, that is not true, right? Many people who die by suicide have talked about or given definite warning signs of their suicidal intent. And that ties in directly to the second myth, which is suicide happens without warning. There are almost always warning signs, but the, the, the problem is that people around them um, are not aware that this is a warning sign or that this is a significant thing. Like let's say I come I come and I'm giving you my things, I ask you to take care of take care of my ring, take care of my I leave in my jewelry, etc. Right? You might just it might just register me as that's a little odd, but only afterwards then sometimes people will put together the picture of it, okay? Um, people, and, and, and that's no fault of, of yours, I mean, it's simply because the average person does not interact with suicidal persons on a regular basis. So unless you've been educated, like what is going on right now, you would not know what to look for, but that can be something that can provoke um, feelings of guilt. I don't know if anyone, um, and I guess you can, you can share that if you want to when we get to the question and answer session, if anyone has lost someone to suicide, right? So, 
Next myth is people are having suicidal thoughts are fully intent on dying and there's nothing others can do or say that will help. This is not, not true. Most suicidal people want to live. Um, it's just that they cannot see any alternatives to their problems. They don't know how to solve it. Their coping strategies, their coping resources have been exhausted. So they think, well, the only way to deal with this now is if I was not here. Because if I'm here, I don't have to feel stressed. I don't have to feel pain. I don't have to feel depressed, etc. All right. Improvement over, over suicide. Improvement in a suicidal individual means the danger is over. And this is not true. Um, sometimes suicides may you see it here it says suicides occur several months after the beginning of improvement and this is because the person has energy to act on suicidal thoughts especially if it's related to depression because depression can really stop um chronic like major depressive disorder can stop energy the motivation to do things so when someone starts to come out of that um, depression and they start energy that they can do things one of the things that they might decide to do okay, is that okay. they may um they may finally have the energy to act on their suicidal thoughts and this one this is a big myth again asking are you thinking about committing suicide may trigger a person to make a suicide attempt or put thoughts in their head all right and and that is not true um usually if somebody is is getting to the point that they're that they're considering suicide they probably have been thinking about it for a long time much longer time than you would even realize all right so asking direct what it says here asking direct Caring questions about suicide will often minimize a person's anxiety and act as a deterrent to suicidal behavior. And the reason for that, um, you will see, right? On the next slide, I have some tips. But just here, and again, I cannot say this enough, if someone has expressed suicidal ideation or has attempted suicide to you, right? You should take them to see a professional as soon as possible. It is not your responsibility to try and save them and it says save in quotation marks on your own. Doing that takes professional training, and even that sometimes is not successful. Okay? So every anytime somebody expresses um, suicidal ideation, as you know, the thought or something like that, take it seriously, ask them a question. Yeah? And take them to see a professional. If it is that they're actually um, saying that they want, they will do it. You don't, you don't, um, don't lag on it right don't lag on it then don't worry about the stigma and and things about about um about how it might look if they have to go to the psychiatric hospital or things like that because and i don't want to be too harsh um here but sometimes the the the, the consequence of of not acting on that could be that the person actually attempts suicide and then they're successful okay so I have some tips here for interacting with someone who is suicidal. So take all talks and signs of suicidal behavior seriously. Do not play it down or ignore the situation. If they say something, ask them about it. Ask them in a caring way, as we said just now, but you ask them about it. All right? Um, I mean, so just because of the Bajan sense of humor, sometimes people make jokes and say things about suicide. You know, we will come out of, and like students, I, as you know, I teach, I teach at BCC. So students will come out of, and uh, that exam nearly killed me. I know we can do after that exam, you know, and we, that's in our language, but we really have to be sensitive about it. And if something um, catches your attention, ask a question, right? If it is that you know someone is, ex you gather that they are serious or that they have attempted, right? Um, while you are trying to get professional help, do your best to remove them from being nearby the potential means of suicide, okay? Because again, you don't want to be near things that they can use. Be willing to listen, allow expressions of feelings. So let people say how they're feeling and don't criticize them. Don't criticize them. You're, you're, you're not, and you see this in another point that I make on the next slide, you're not there to judge, right? Let them express their feelings. The, the reason why they might be thinking of committing suicide, someone might, you know, you have murder suicides, um, particularly in intimate relationships, all right? So if somebody is, somebody says that they're feeling suicide because they, they get horned, right? As you would say, the, the colloquial term that they get horned, you know, because of infidelity or unfaithfulness, right, of their partner. And even though you might be strong enough that that may not affect you, because usually when you say that, somebody can say a horn is not a horn. Our horn is only a horn if you take it on or something. So, right? But you don't worry about what is working for you. If this person says that this is a problem that they don't know how to get past, you accept that. All right? Don't criticize them. Convey to the individual that you're concerned about their well being. And that's the attitude that you want to have. All right? Um, 
be non-judgmental. Do not debate morality or whether suicide is right or wrong or whether feelings are good or bad. And don't don't tell them about you should you got so much to be thankful for. What are you thinking what are you thinking about committing suicide? You are grateful. That that really is not going to help the situation. It'll be better for you to keep your mouth shut. All right? Now, these last two here, you can see that I have an asterisk by them, and this is because um, you might not be able to do this um, simply because it might be something shocking to you. But I say here, do your best to not act shocked, all right? Because this will likely put distance between you and the person. You acting shocked might cause them to feel rejected in the moment, and they may not want to talk with you anymore, right? They may not want to open up to you because, again, acting shocked about something is a way that we judge people. Yeah, if you think about that, when I say something, you look, you look really taken aback, and <gasps> yeah, that makes me feel, that makes me feel, you know, weird. That makes me feel um, like an outsider. Okay, and then the next thing is that to talk, and again, asterisk by this because you might not be able to do this, right? Um, and for a professional to do this, it takes training. All right, but you talk openly and matter of fact about suicide. Suicide can be an uncomfortable topic. I mean, even listening to me now talking about this might be uncomfortable for some of you, but if you are capable of it, talk openly and matter-of-factly about suicide. All right, ask about the suicide directly. Example, are you having thoughts of killing yourself or of suicide? Or for someone who's expressing these thoughts, do you have a plan for when and how you intend to kill yourself? Okay, and the best way is to be direct, and but still show that you are concerned about their well-being. Now, here I have some resources that you can reach out to. And if ever, I hope that you don't ever find yourself in that situation but you have um, the Barbados Psychiatric Hospital, they have a 24-hour assessment unit. You call 536-1391 and you will speak to the nurse. I think it's usually the nurse that is on call that night and they will give you further instructions on how you can come in or you can just do a walk-in. All right, they, they accept walk-ins as well. Yeah, 24 hours, so they just accept walk-ins. But if you want to call, you can call and say, well, my relative um, is having um, suicidal thoughts, he, I caught him trying to kill himself, and I don't know what to do. Or it might be you, if you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, and they will they will instruct you probably to come in or what, what to do, okay? You also have the Queen Elizabeth Hospital's 24-hour hotline. You can go to a &E as well, because a &E, um, the hospital does have the psychiatric ward C4, but you can call the 24-hour hotline and see if you can get help from there as well too, okay? The numbers are here on the screen. The, um, the National Youth Support 24-hour hotline, the same thing as I said, I helped um, with, the, with the setting up of this. I did some training for the persons who are answering the hotline. 539-HELP, um, 539-4357, and that is set for young people, right? Um, but if you call, um, and they, they will direct you, they will try to put you in contact with whatever resource. So it's not just for suicide. If you have other emotional problems or you're just feeling mental pressure, they will um, direct you to where the best person that can handle your call. I have these other ones here, um, Family Planning, Mental Health Crisis, 24-hour hotline. I think this is still up. I can't confirm these. I found these, but I, I'm not sure if they're up and running right now. So 233-4249. You also have the community mental health officer that attached to all polyclinics, right? And they should be accessible from 8.30 to 4.30 p.m., Monday to Friday. So again, if you have a challenge, call the polyclinic. Or maybe if you visit the polyclinic and explain what is going on, and the mental health officer probably will come to visit you, or um, they will arrange for something to happen so that you can um, receive some sort of attention. Network services, which you might be familiar with because you're all government workers, right? Um, and these are the numbers here. They also have a number for after hours emergencies. Um, they might be able to give you some um, some advice as well. You have the CASA crisis hotline, which is a hotline um, similar to the 24-hour youth hotline, but um, they were wrong before, and they will deal with all sorts of issues as well, all sorts of mental health issues, and if I remember correctly, that's a 24-hour line as well. They have men's empowerment network too, that you can give a call to. All right? Now, just key points, just to wrap up, and then we hit the question and answers, okay? So mental health is about more than mental illness. Monitoring and taking care of our mental health is best done proactively. It's a skill that takes time and effort. We have to commit to working on it. All right, and that is, is our best um, our best preparation for coping with challenges. If we have the resources, we know our resources, and we take care of ourselves, then we are better able to cope with challenges when they come. Suicidal thoughts are an indicator of poor mental health, and they should be addressed by professionals. Right? 
it is important to take any instance of suicidal ideations or attempts seriously. And then just the general guideline for interacting with persons who might have expressed suicidal thoughts or had a suicide attempt, you interact with them in a non-judgmental, non compassionate way to let them know that they are cared for. All right. Now, I just have some references here um, in case you want to see where you got my information from. You would just you can just go back through the recording of the of this to see if you really um, do want to check and see anything about that. All right. No, and I also have some of that included on the slides. So, what questions do you have? Colleagues, we've reached the question and answer segment of our presentation this morning. So I'm inviting you to place any questions that you may have in the chat. I see someone has already uh, gone ahead and done that. Yeah. And so, yeah, the I question to you, Lauren, is how can we mask the shock of hearing a person wants to commit suicide since we are persons since we are normally people who wear our emotions on our face. Well, um, I mean, I, I can't give you I can't give you any immediate tips for that because if, if it is that it's coming out in a conversation, you are not expecting it. It might happen, but don't beat yourself up about that. As I said, um, for a therapist or, or a professional, that is something that that we have to practice. All right, um, and we we are probably better at it because we might hear all sorts of shocking things. Um, on a daily basis, so we, we recognize that we are very aware, uh, and we also are in the moment aware of what is going on. So we have preparation that we might hear shocking things. But if someone just comes out and tells you like that in a conversation, there's there's little that you can do simply because we are humans and we have emotional reactions. So that's why that's why you put the asterisk next to that and said if you can, right? If you do have that um, control, as I know some people would say that, as we would say, sometimes you gotta fix your face, right? So, so if you do have that control, just bear in mind that, um, or even after the conversation goes on, even if you have the initial shock, do your best to compose your face. All right, do your best to compose your face. Because even, even how your facial expression looks, but more important is your, your expression of, of words. Because you might look shocked, but if you express compassion um, with that shock, the person may interpret it differently. But if you look shocked and they say, why well, you feel that? And you know, we go into criticizing mode, then that then that can be um, that is a real challenge. So you you just do your best. And I mean after they've expressed it, then you make an effort to to really control you control your face. Okay, but as I said, I know everybody cannot do that. All right. I hope that helps, Claudette. Next. Oh yes, it does. Okay. Thank you so much for posting Cedric Roberts the link to a workshop that could help. Um, Marquita has also posted a question. Suppose you're not trained, but a suicide person has bonded with you and doesn't want to speak to the professional. How do you handle that? You continually encourage them to speak to the professional. All right. Um, and and if if they are suicidal, really and truly, how they, how they, how they feel about it, if you have evidence that they are suicidal, how they feel about whether or not they want to speak to professional. The we have laws in place that they, they can be detained at um at the psychiatric hospital or they can be detained at um QEH, all right? Because sometimes everyone does not want to engage. Um but again I strongly want to discourage you, everybody that's listening to this, to to thinking that you can handle it on your own. So the way to go forward with that is that you continually encourage them. You continually encourage them and explain to them that you do you are you are not a professional and that they need professional help. Right? Um so I mean if you if you want to and this is not I'm not trivializing it now. So I just want I just I I teach best um through through examples. So let's say that let's say that um your your bathroom you you have a problem with your plumbing. The pipe bursts, right? And but you prefer you prefer me because I'm a mason. But I really don't know about fixing pipes. Yeah. So I encourage the person. You need to get a plumber because I I can't I I don't know how to help you. I'm not equipped to help you. And not in the sense not in the sense that I don't care, but I do not have the resources. Okay, Marquita. So you really really stay on that and stay committed to that 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 encourage them to speak to the professional and um, what you can do also as well 
you can tell them that you will go with them to speak to the professional. All right. So if they don't want to go by themselves, tell them that I will go with you and I will sit down. The, I will sit down in the office for you. I will. I will go down. Um, I, will, I will go down. I will go down to Black Rock with you. I mean, we can see somebody, but we, we book the psychiatrist and we, we go and see the psychiatrist together. I will be with you every step of the way, but you need to see a professional. All right. So it's the same thing. If, if you were sick and you had some sort of um, pain or some sort of wound, you, you're, you, you're not equipped to deal with it. You need to go to a doctor. You might be afraid to go to the doctor, but I will come with you. All right. I will, I will accompany you. But, but don't keep pushing that. Keep pushing that. Okay. In some cases, they may need to be hospitalized. But that that is um, not not your decision to make. All right. I hope that helps, Marquita. Okay, Thank you, see. Marquita. Um, another question I see posted is: How can you cope with the loss of a loved one by suicide? Um. the The reality is is that for one. You've lost someone, so you, you have grieving. Sometimes people will struggle with feelings of feelings of guilt. All right, and so and again, I recently had an experience that I, I did some training um, with the organization, and this was a topic that came. And then somebody from that organization um, committed suicide. So then some some of the persons that were in the training and they said that they saw. They recognize some of the same things that the same symptoms and stuff, the same warning signs that I just told you all this morning, right? Um, they they recognize that, but they only recognize it in hindsight, right? So sometimes you, you you may experience guilt, and you may even feel angry. Um, if you look up like you know the there's the whole thing about the stages of grief, um, and you have to be give yourself grace, be kind to yourself to to grieve. Right, that's the first thing. You may also consider that you may need to go and see a therapist as well um, to, to talk about how you're feeling. Right? Um, a therapist or a trained counselor of some sort, the same thing I'm with. Uh, we mentioned it before, men, um, not men, network services. Right? You may book a couple of sessions with someone to go and discuss it to help you process the loss that you've experienced. All right? But it is, it is, it is the, the feelings that we, would, we, we will experience with grief, typically, but then also you have the added, um, the added confusion, right? Um, sometimes because you might not understand why someone might want to commit suicide or why they committed suicide, I should say. And also then, if we, we, we have the guilt that we think, I should have done something more to help them. All right, so there, there's not an easy answer to that. You can also go online. There's some forums online if you um, look for... You, what you have to look for online is survivors of um, suicide or survivors of or relatives of, of suicide survivors and you can find some so, um, resources that may help you to work through that process. I hope that helps. Okay, uh, another question I see posted is if you thwart a person's attempt at suicide and their first statement to you is, why didn't you tell me? How do you deal with that? You go right back to but, the compassion, Jennifer. Um, so you tell them, because I care about you, I don't want you to kill yourself. I don't want to lose you, right? Um, and don't, don't interpret it in an aggressive way. I mean, you tell them that you, the whole thing is that you want to express to them that you matter. You're important. I, I I will miss you. People will miss you if if you if you go through with this. Okay. So so and again, if if you inter if you interrupted them again, you should really take them to, to get some professional attention. All right. But but just express compassion. Let them know that that they matter. That you want to help and you don't you don't want them to die no matter how they feel, because that, that statement is going to come from the whole, as I said, they are not operating on the same logic or the same rationality that we are operating under. They're operating under that. This is the answer to my problems. Why are you stopping me from, from working, from starting out myself? Again, as, as uh, morbid as that sounds, right? But that, that, is, that is their thought process. So it will not make sense to a 
that healthy um, functioning mind, healthy thinking mind. So again, you let your default be that you demonstrate compassion and, and support to them and let them know that you, you, you don't want them to do that. Right? Whatever the question is, that, that is your that's what you, you are aiming to express to, to them. Right. I hope that helps, Jennifer. Leandra wanted further clarification on accessing psychiatric hospital for those who are having suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, I can, I can see it. I think I have a chat open. The, well, the process is if, if, you're having, um, if you're having suicidal thoughts, then you go and you get assessed. Right? You get assessed um, by either by a trained professional, so either the psychiatrist or the, um, the, the psychiatric nurse that is, on, that is on duty that night, but they will carry out their assessment. And, and if that assessment um, necessitates that you'll be hospitalized for a little bit for your, your safety, all right, then, then that may have to happen. All right, but the, I, I cannot speak because I am not trained my training, my training as a therapist does not um, does not arrive to the point that I, I make the assumption of, uh, sorry, not the assumption, I make the determination of whether someone needs to be hospitalized or not. But what I will say is that you, if you, if someone is hospitalized, then they are being hospitalized because the professionals have identified that there is a real risk that if, that this person might attempt suicide. Um, quite soon, all right? Um, so once that happens, then, then the process is, then, then you go through the intake process. Um, I, 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 as I said, as a therapist, I, do, I don't have to work on the, um, on the assessment, assessment unit, which is where, that, um, which is where that, that happens. So I can't tell you the specifics of the process, but I would say that um, it's just that if, if they're concerned for your safety, and if you if you are concerned about the person's safety as well, then sometimes that may be the better option just for just for a little bit, okay? But again, because the, the other option is that um, they may act on on their suicidal thoughts. All right. Um, you also have the option. Remember, you also have the option of of any as well too that you can go there. So there are there is a psychiatrist that is attached to, to um, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, I should say. Okay, was that helpful, Leandra? Interesting, thank you. The T. Clark is referring to one of the slides that you had, I believe, on the model for well being, Sally the Sally slide. And the question is if you already pointed them in the direction of counseling and you even went to a, even went with them to a session, what else can you do? Um, you mean okay? Sorry, just um, T. Clark. Sally's, just to, one with yeah. Sally's, Sally's uh, I, I, I remember it, um, but just just to clarify, um, you mean there you went with them to the session and then they're not going to the sessions, or you mean like how how can you act to support them while while they're going through the depressive episode? Is it that they that they are are they doing what they're supposed to do? or they're not doing what they're supposed to do, and you want to know what you can do to get them to do what they're supposed to do. He Clark can unmute and, and just give further clarity as to what you're asking. Okay, um, good morning again. Morning. Person not doing what they're supposed to do, and they're just relaxing all the time. So how can I be supportive to them? Because it is vain on my mental health as well. Um, that's a that's a that's a difficult question, uh, Miss Clark. Um, I mean, you you can only do do your part, do what do what is within your capability. You encourage them, but the why 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 put in that slide that I had? Um, I I did have it for suicide, but also for um, things like other mental health, other other illnesses, other disorders. We are really not um, responsible. For the choices that people make, we can just do our best to encourage them, 
but there comes a point where we have to recognize that someone is an adult and they're making their own choices we can't really force them and particularly like um, if unless they unless they are unless they are becoming a danger to themselves or to others then there's there won't be any reason uh, for them to be hospitalized typically right so I mean you can you can use some of the same tools that, that I mentioned before so you can approach them with compassion aim to have heart to heart to them explain to them help them to help, try to help them to get to see what how their behavior is contributing to the situation that they're in um, assuming that they, they don't like the situation that they're in right but in some cases that and that's why I said on that slide that in some cases people don't respond they even even and that that is a that is um uh that is a, a burden that that we are aware of as as professionals in mental health you can do your best you can do the utmost i do the best therapy sessions um made myself available work with the family try to create a, a supportive environment all of that and someone might still commit commit suicide right sometimes you have um people who are very determined okay so you you continue with the compassion and you you continue to to express um your support for them if you if you still have the resources to because the other thing is that if it's starting to weigh on your mental health then um you may need to to start considering how you can take a step back from that person um and not take a step back it does not necessarily mean because in some cases it might be a relative it might be a son or your daughter or your brother or something like that but you have to um maybe limit your your interaction with them and and they may have to experience the consequences of their actions as again as as harsh as that sounds but it is not going to be productive if you allow them to cause you to get into a state of mental unwellness okay so sometimes we have to make hard decisions and sometimes that's a, that's a hard conversation that I may have to have with the family um, and you have to respect some people's autonomy at times but aside from that you you work to demonstrate the compassion you try to find resources try to find alternative resources if you need to bring somebody else to talk to them that might get through to them all of those things you can do okay but at the end of the day the possibility exists that that may not help okay so that's not that's not an ideal answer but that's the best that i can uh, suggest all right we're going to take our final question for this morning's presentation um when you tell a person they need middle so they need professional help they may understand that you were saying that they're crazy is there a better way to say that they need professional help um I mean, you might just want to leave out the word professional, right? Um, but how, how if you want to, call, because the, the other option is, is that if you, if you don't tell them about it, if you don't tell them about it, you may, it might be a bit more of a shock if you just take them to the psychiatric hospital. But generally, I think persons would, if somebody's attempting suicide, if we're just talking about suicide here, um, Griffith, Stephen Griffith, if you're only talking about suicide here, then I think typically people will recognize that suicide is an abnormal, an abnormal response. So it's not necessarily that you're saying that they're crazy, but it is not, that's not the answer, right? And everybody doesn't go around trying to commit suicide. So how, how you say that you, if you want to say that I think you need help because I don't want you to harm yourself, if you want to make it, if you want to approach it in an objective fashion, Right? Of course, you don't have to say that you're crazy, that you're mad and stuff like that. Those are no no terms, right? But you say that you you need to get some help, and I am not the person to help you. That there's and you can just say even if you say that they need professional help, but you can make it a bit more objective by saying that you need help um, from a professional in this area. Okay, so you you make you describe it in terms, which is what it is that. There are people who are trained to help you when you have problems like this. So that's where the professional comes comes from. All right. So you can just say that you need help, and I think and and I think that um, 
it's best that we talk to a mental health professional. Okay? That helps. Does that professionally help you, Stephen? Yes, it does. Okay. Because, and sorry, um, before you go on, um, Stephen, just just another thought quickly, is that you 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 can just say that I want I want you to get some help. You just if you just just in the actual way, you just devote the professional, right? You just want you to get some help, and I think that this person can help you. Of course, either way, if they realize that you're going to say catch a hospital or it's a psychiatrist that you're going to, they they will still get that same sentiment that that you're concerned about. But hopefully, by that time it might be too late. But then they realize what's going on, and you can get them to speak to someone. But you just just say help. I just want I just want you to get some help help with this because I'm concerned about you. And the idea is that you focus on them, that they understand that you care about them and you care about their well being, and you don't want them to hurt their, themselves. Colleagues, we've come to the end of our webinar presentation for today. I just want to thank you very much for joining. Um, we will take note of the other comments and questions that you might have placed in the chat that we weren't able to cover with you this morning, and we will seek to respond to those to those um, questions. By we will pass them on to Lauren and have him respond to your questions that we haven't been able to cover. So I trust that you've gained some valuable knowledge and insight in terms of what is mental health and the components, the component indicators of mental health, as well as managing and monitoring your mental health. And uh, one of the things that I noted that Lauren said is that we have to be intentional about maintaining our mental health. And it's a skill that we need to take time and effort developing. And also one of the things that he would have emphasized is that it's important to seek professional assistance for any of our, our loved ones or even ourselves when we realize that we are having we're having um, negative thoughts or we're having suicide ideation as he would have gone through with us this evening this morning so we at the learning and development directorate are expressing our thanks to you for joining the webinar this morning we look forward to sharing with you again in another webinar or sometime in the near future uh, please assist us as we prepare for these future webinars by completing the participant feedback form that is going to be placed in the chat and this feedback is very important to us as we seek to enhance and add value to our webinar presentation so i want to thank you in advance for assisting us in completing our feedback a tremendous and heartfelt thank you to our presenter today, Mr. Lauren Braffitt. Lauren, it was indeed a pleasure teaming up with you in this venture. And thank you so much as well to my colleague, Ms. Fayan Jordan, for so ably assisting and supporting me during the morning's webinar presentation. Thank you to colleagues for joining. Without your participation, it would not have made this webinar a success. So I take this opportunity to wish all who would have joined our, and are participated in any way in the webinar presentation today a pleasant remainder of the day. Do take care and goodbye for now. Um, Sheila? Yes, please. Do you want me to leave the, um, the form open in the chat just for a little bit so people can click on it? Or... Yes, please. Okay. So leave it there. You can just scroll up because they am posted it at 11.32. Thanks so much. You're welcome.